Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is another episode of Dadvice TV Live. Now, for those of you that are new, say hello. Tell us where you're from. It's great to have you here. And look at this. We got people from Texas, another Texas. We got San Francisco, California. Oh, I miss California. Woo! Used to live down in SoCal. Now tonight, everybody, we are going to talk about what is probably one of the most important things that kidney patients should be thinking of and talking about, yet it is so often not discussed. And we are talking about, I'm going to try to say this, okay, you guys who know me, who have seen Dr. Rowan here before talking about this, you know I hate this word because I it is just such a tongue twister, but we are going to talk about ather atherosclerosis i think i got it <laughs> hardening of the arteries which is a very very serious and extremely dangerous condition especially for those with kidney disease now to help talk about it we've got a great co-host the the author and the creator of the best book for kidney patients and the book that each and every one of you should at least have a copy of if i could make a rule it would be if you were diagnosed with kidney disease, they would hand you this book and say, I know it sounds scary, but read this book. It's going to make it easier to understand and far less scary for you. I'm talking about the book, Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease, which is written by our very own Dr. Rosansky. It makes understanding kidney disease so clear, so simple, and more importantly, it takes away so much of the worry because you know what matters, you know what to look for, you know what you need to do to help manage your kidney disease and with a focus on staying healthy and improving your quality and longevity of life. Now let's go ahead and get to my co-host. Please give a great big giant Dad Advice TV welcome to Dr. Steven Rosansky. Hey, Doc. Hey, James. Good to see you and always great to be on your show. Hi, everybody. And we've got a, <clears throat> a really important topic tonight, not just for all of you CK, CKD patients, but you're all going to have people that will learn a lot from the information you're getting tonight. And I would please ask them to tune into this uh, show after you've seen it and tell lots of folks around your, uh, your town and your friends and family that this is something everybody really should take seriously because it's certainly important for you as a kidney patient, but it's important for everybody else because the three leading causes of death, number one is what we're talking about tonight, the heart, number two is cancer, and the third we're going to talk about in two weeks is strokes. And this stuff is preventable and it's also something that you need to know what to do if you have any of the signs of one of these problems going on, either a heart attack or a brain attack, because knowing this can save your life or can save someone you know's life. So this is big stuff and important stuff. And before we jump into it, I have a question for the audience to kind of validate what I believe is most people's experience. I'd like everyone out there to let us know, has your doctor spoken to you about your heart health, about um, hardening of the arteries? Is this a conversation that you've had with your doctors? Let us know in the comments. Um, it's extremely important that Dr. Rowe and I were just talking before the show it's not a conversation my doctor has had with me. And we kind of looked at some of my last, we're like this should be something that we should be working on and talking about together during my normal visits with my doctor. So I am curious, am I the oddball out there or are other people not having this conversation with their doctor? All right, Dr. Rowe. While they're, I'm trying to give them a moment to type this because there's about a 30 second delay for me asking the question. <laughs> hey, and results are now starting to pop in. Uh, Craig from California says, nope, <clears throat> not from his doctor. I have a feeling that's what most people are going to say. You want me to give my background, James? For yeah, yeah. Let's let everyone know your background. 
so they know why the things you say are so important to listen to and that you are qualified to talk about this. Well, I told James uh, when I got on the show that I got a letter in the mail about a reunion, 50th reunion of my medical school graduation. So I've been in the business a long time. I can't believe it's 50 years because when I was in med school and they had the reunions, and I go, oh, look at that 50 year. Are they still alive that long? It's like, I'm going to see how many of my colleagues are still alive. But I practice kidney disease, uh, uh, taking care of kidney patients over 40 years. Uh, I've written a book that James told you about uh, called Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease to help you folks understand uh, when you should or should not worry. Most of you should not worry, and you'll see why in my book. Uh, it also will tell you, um, importantly, if you have advanced kidney disease, when it makes sense to delay dialysis, which for most patients is probably a good idea because most people are starting dialysis way too early. <clears throat> and I've got a, a big chapter in my book on today's topic atherosclerosis <laughs> okay and I, i'm glad you did not ask me to say it i practiced so many times atherosclerosis almost yeah, i missed yeah. the l there um and tonight and this is why you all should get other folks to listen to it because i'm sure you know people with this common number one cause of death in this uh in the world um <clears throat> because there's a lot of medical treatments that are being done, a lot of workups that are being done. A lot of it's not necessary. And there's also uh, signs that you need to know to save your life. And we'll start out by telling you that 80% of early heart disease and strokes can be prevented with the healthy lifestyle healthy habits that we've been talking about, uh, this can have a massive effect. So take it seriously, all the stuff we've talked about, and we're going to get into it some more uh, in today's discussion and in two weeks. What is atherosclerosis? Where does it come from? Athero means paste in Greek. It's that pasty cholesterol junk in your arteries. And I don't know if any of you have um, had the opportunity to see a postmortem exam. A lot of a lot of the stuff is on TV. If you look inside your arteries, you're going to find this junk, this 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 paste. It looks um, like plaque, correct? Yes. And um, the other thing, sclerosis means harden, hardness in Greek. That's how we get hardening of the arteries. That name's much easier to pronounce. <laughs> All right. So like most of your kidney disease, this is slow. It's not something that comes on rapidly. It comes on your entire life. It starts early in life. And as you get older, unfortunately, it gets uh, more aggressive and happens quicker. What's going on? The excess cholesterol which we were just talking about, James, cholesterol levels, it will accumulate on the walls of your arteries over decades. The body reacts to it, sends out those white blood cells. You heard of those, when you get an infection, those white blood cells attack it. And, uh, and, it, and it leaves dead cells on the lining of your arteries and scars. And that's the cholesterol plaque. And if you get enough of this stuff, you can block the arteries and you can also get clots forming on the arteries. And uh, if you get the clot stuck in there, it, you can't get the blood to the heart muscle. And in two weeks, we'll talk about getting the blood to your brain. That's what it's all about. Now, is, does, as this builds up, is it kind of permanent or is it like, okay, well, if you start doing things better, it'll go away? Permanent, permanent. Your goal is to slow it down. Your goal is to keep things from getting worse. No cure. There's no cure for kidney disease. 
There's no cure for atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. Your goal is to slow it down so you don't wind up with a heart attack or a stroke and you don't wind up on a kidney machine. That's your goal. <clears throat> and <clears throat> you asked me this a couple of weeks ago, James, about studies to show reversal. They've tried to show reversal of the plaque. No real good evidence. What you're doing is you're slowing it down. You're slowing down the buildup of the plaque. So why are we talking about this on this kidney show? James, do you know why? Well, my understanding is mm -hmm. people don't die of kidney disease. They die from this. This is this is the killer. So we gotta we gotta focus on taking care of it. And James, you are one hundred percent right because I I bet you if we took even kidney specialists who have all the knowledge about stages of kidney disease and and how to analyze all that stuff and all the various diagnoses of kidney disease, including all the rare diagnoses, they may not know why these categories of CKD, especially stage three, which is the massive one, which is what most of your viewers have, 30 to 60 EGFR. It's because it's a risk factor for hardening of the arteries. And therefore, James was 100% right. If you're a doctor, any doctor who's talking to a patient should be focusing on this, and certainly your kidney doctor should. And it turns out that the lower your kidney number, the more your urine protein, the more your risk of getting these hardening of the artery problems. And then we've also talked about this a few times. What's the number one cause, listed cause of people going on dialysis? James, do you know? I do, but hold on, I can't remember. <laughs> I was waiting for you to say one of the number one causes of like bad habits and leading into smoking. <laughs> That's what I thought you were going at first. I can't think of what the number one. Diabetes. Oh, diabetes, yes, diabetes. yes, yes, yes. Followed diabetes. by high blood pressure, uncontrolled. Diabetes, number one listed cause of kidney failure for dialysis patients worldwide. And it turns out that your risk of hardening of the arteries goes up with kidney disease and it also goes up with diabetes. Diabetics with kidney disease, you folks are, are I'm sorry to say, at the highest risk of getting these complications. And so the goal for all of you, for all of us, is to stabilize our arteries to decrease the risk of getting these bad events. <clears throat> and like I said, tonight we're talking about the heart. Next two weeks, we'll talk about the brain. Uh, so we're talking about blood flow to the heart, blood flow to the brain. Uh, the other areas of the body, which are not as common to get blood flow problems are your extremities, especially your legs. And then something which is a lot less common is something called aneurysms, where the walls of the arteries get weak. We'll touch on that next time. So what about the big one? The heart attack, the coronary artery. So coronary is heart. The heart attack is usually the large arteries of the heart, the coronary arteries. The heart attack is generally thought about as a blockage of one of those major coronary arteries. And here's something that can save your life. If you experience any of these symptoms, call 911. These are the attack warning signs. And it can start slowly. The pain can be mild at first, but pay attention. And here's the way it can present. <clears throat> the, the common thing is I got an elephant sitting on my chest. That is classic, but it could be a lot more subtle and it can last for a few minutes and go away and then come back. Uh, it's generally a pressure, a squeezing, a fullness. Uh, and the pain is not always in the chest. You can have pain in your arms, 
in your back, in your jaw, even in your stomach. I'll tell you a quick story. I got a colleague of mine uh, who worked with me on a lot of my research. And uh, my colleague's friend is Kirby. So Kirby was very active. He was a big white water uh, canoeer, you know, rode a bike, very active, very physically active. And he said, you know, Steve, I get this pain in my fingers every time I exercise. That's classic. Pain in your fingers can happen as a form of angina or chest pain due to decreased blood flow. Um, the other thing some people get is, is even shortness of breath. And some people break out in a cold sweat or they get nauseated, they get lightheaded. So um, women, unfortunately, can be harder to diagnose. I mean, most women will have the, the classic elephant on the chest, but they can have other symptoms like um, they may get this pain in different places like we just discussed. They may get it in the jaw, the back, and they may just feel extreme fatigue, no energy. Or they may just have, they may be a person who has angina or the chest pain from decreased blood from the heart. It just doesn't go away. And sometimes women um, uh, may get it with stress. Uh, and so there's the large coronary arteries, the major coronary arteries, and then there's small blood vessels. This is called small blood vessel disease, more common in diabetics and a woman. And in this case, uh, the test that we're going to discuss in a little bit, the diagnostic test may not show anything, but people may still have chest pain due to small artery disease. And this can be picked up with certain sophisticated uh, x-ray studies. Uh, and these are people that sometimes get treated for their chest pain with Angioplasty, do you know what that is by any chance, James? Angioplasty? I do not know, but I've heard it so many times on TV. Angioplasty is basically putting a balloon in a blood vessel, <sighs> blow it up to, to, to make it bigger. That's an angioplasty. Uh, actually, the guy, the sad story, I'll tell you a quick sad story. The guy who invented angioplasty uh, was in Atlanta. And he was with one of his residents in an airplane and they crashed and died, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. The guy who invented this procedure and this is done all over the world. Um, people that have small vessel disease, they may get the chest pain with stress doing daily activities uh, and less during the physical activity, the cl classic diagnosis of, uh, decreased blood flow to the coronaries is on exercise. You can get chest pain with stress and exercise. <clears throat> now, um, if you have any of these symptoms, you, your doctor may do some tests. And there is absolutely no reason to be getting these tests to look for coronary artery disease if you're not symptomatic. So many doctors do annual stress tests as a business. No need for it. <sighs> but if you're having any of these symptoms, um, it would make sense to consider some of these tests. So what are the tests that we do to see if you're getting enough blood to the arteries of your heart? A common uh, test is a, a nuclear stress test. Have you ever had that, James? You know what that now, is? I've had the one where you get on the treadmill. Right. And they injected had, something. Yeah, I had, uh, if I remember right, like an inferior fractum or something like that. They they say it's like a baby heart attack. And it shows up always oh. on the EKG. I have a little line Got that it. just goes the wrong way and it always shows up. Okay. Now I have two of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Uh, basically, they inject something radioactive. Uh, they put you on a, they stress your heart. And the idea is if the heart during exercise is not getting enough blood, you'll see that you'll get one 
before exercise and after exercise. That's the nuclear test. The other tests that are commonly done are the coronary angiogram. In this case, and I've had one of those done, they, they, they could stick a, a tube in your groin or sometimes in your arm in an artery and they thread the artery into the main artery of your body, the aorta, and into the coronary arteries, these little arteries, and they take a picture of all the arteries of the heart. Two other tests that are done, it's called a CT coronary. Instead of putting the catheter all the way up into your heart, they just inject dye and take pictures of your arteries and CT. And then there's another test where they look at the calcium in the coronary arteries. It's called a car coronary artery calcium scan, also done in a CT machine. And here's the deal, folks. None of these invasive tests, whether it's a coronary angiogram, which I've had, or the CT angiogram, or the calcium study, they're not any better at predicting the risk of having a heart attack than just getting one of the non-invasive studies like a nuclear study on a treadmill. So pretty much none uh, of them are better than the other? That's right. That's right. And... They're not recommended, they have no benefit if you're not having symptoms. Having one of these tests in patients without symptoms is not gonna reduce your chances of dying of a heart attack. And are any of these tests bad for kidney patients where they're injecting things into us? Absolutely, James, thank you. You've got, you come up with something. That comment down there, important. that's who <laughs> asked it's it. Extremely important, not nuclear stress. Because the nuclear, the radioactive stuff is not harmful to the kidneys. But the dye, the contrast in the coronary angiogram can cause kidney failure. Or the CT, the contrast, and either done with the usual one where they stick the artery, stick it in your artery up into your heart, or just stick it into your arm. When they put that contrast in, if you're a kidney patient, you can get your kidneys to shut down. Good question, James. You can get kidney failure, especially if you're diabetic and you have a decreased GFR. It is extremely dangerous. You've got to, if, if, and, and again, it's got to be a good reason to do one of these tests because it can produce kidney failure. So keep that in mind. Thank you, James. Very good question. Um, the small vessel disease, which again is, is kind of the diagnosis of exclusion. You're symptomatic, but they don't find anything in the usual artery tests uh, is diagnosed with something called a PET scan. So again, you want to stabilize the vessels, whether you got small vessel disease, large vessel disease, you want to do all of the things that we're going to talk about at length to decrease your risk of hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis. I'm gonna get into them in a minute. Now, what about stents? I bet you a lot of people that are gonna see this show already have a stent. Well, my guess is most of you did not need it, unfortunately. There is one absolute indication to get a stent and where it can be enormously beneficial. If you are having one of those signs of a heart attack and you go to the hospital, they will, what's the first thing they're gonna do? If What's the first medicine? And Nitroglycerin. You can at home? Huh? No, well, nope. yeah, that's one, but you can take it at that's home. That's what they gave me. <laughs> right. Oh, I okay. think you can take it home, aspirin. Yes, yes, you're going to get an aspirin because aspirin can help decrease the clots. And that's why people that have had a heart attack or a stroke have a brain attack or a heart attack. Again, next time we'll talk about brain attacks. Uh, should be on aspirin, baby aspirin, 80, 81 milligrams, because it can potentially keep that clot from forming and causing your heart muscle to die. The other thing that can do it is a stent. Good reason to put a stent in 
if you got it, if you got an artery that's getting ready to close off and you could keep it open with a stent by all means, big deal. But for most of you and most people, you know, who already have stents or are going to get stents, there's no good evidence that putting in a stent will improve your symptoms or save your life any more than the medications we're going to discuss and the lifestyle changes we're going to discuss. If you're stable, you're not having symptoms, you do not need a stent. And even if you have symptoms, you try to treat it medically. That's the first thing you want to do. And yeah, some of the people will go on to have a heart attack, but the fact is the stent is not going to keep you from having a heart attack. It's, it's been shown by numerous studies, and this, these studies have been around for decades, and stents are being put in left and right anyway. Mm. And the reason why, James, is you, if people think, oh, I got a stent, and I'm not going to ever have a heart attack. No, because the, the stent is in one part of the artery, and the unstable part of the artery can be like a tiny distance away, and that can close off. So the stent is not going to necessarily, uh, and it's not been shown to prevent heart attacks. It is something to use if conservative medical treatment, which we'll get into, aren't working, aren't relieving your chest pain. Then now, Doc, you if, you do, if you don't have any of these symptoms, are there any blood tests that indicate, hey, you're headed in the wrong direction? In terms of what I'm not sure I'm not following of name. starting to build up this plaque, getting closer to having a problem. Yeah, unfortunately, we I wish that there was a a good, you know, check the box GFR indicator of your coronary uh, risk of, of getting a heart attack. All of the various ways that we've tried to predict who's going to get a heart attack, they haven't worked. Okay, I mean. We know in general who's at risk. We know what the risk factors are. And we know that when you control the risk factors and do the lifestyle things, we could take care of, you know, three quarters of 80 or 80% of the problem. But one thing, no. Now, yeah, you want to get, and we'll, we'll discuss it in a minute. You want to, as we talked about earlier with your lab results, you want to get your LDL certainly below 100 and if you've got any symptoms like this or you're diabetic and you've ever had any kind of chest pain or coronary or, or cerebral, you know, brain or, or heart stuff, get it below 60. And if your doctor's not doing that, as James and I just discussed, he's not doing or she is not doing good by you. Yeah, my my um, cholesterol, the, 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 the one that we talked about is way too high, well the bad, above 100. Yeah. yeah. The and bad I'm not on anything for it. Yeah, the bad cholesterol is the LDL, the LDL. That's the bad cholesterol. We used to be obsessed over the HDL, and at one point in time, which this was disproven, uh, we tried to take a drug to get your HDL up. That didn't have any benefit, and it was actually harmful. So the, the word on the street for everybody to know is get that LDL below 100, and if you are a diabetic, and you've got, or you've got advanced kidney disease, you've got protein in the urine, I would say get it below 70 or even 60 or less. And there's lots of drugs that can do it. So again, the stents will only make sense if you have gone through all the lifestyle changes that we're going to talk about and all the medicines that we're going to talk about. And you still, you still have a chest pain, get a stent. Otherwise, no, don't need it. Don't need it. And it's like what I talk about in my book, you got advanced kidney disease, your doctors rush to dialysis and a lot of heart doctors rush to put stents in. It's part of the business of medicine, unfortunately. Um, conservative first, try the medical approach first, try all the medical approach. See if you get by with the medical approach before you take a lifelong, lifelong trip down the dialysis road or you get involved with one of these invasive procedures like stents. And stents are not benign, you know, they, they have problems. 
If you get a stent, James, what do you need to take with your stent? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume you're taking some blood thinners. You're exactly right. You're on a blood thinner. And being on blood thinners is, can be dangerous because you can have all kinds of bleeding problems. Mm -hmm. And putting those stents in, I mean, most of the people that put them in are very qualified. But they, there can be a complication putting a stent in. You can tear the blood vessel. So just don't, don't sign up for a stent unless you really need one, obviously. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, uh, let's see here. All right. Um, so I think I've got, let me make sure I got the right. Okay. Now we're going to talk about, oh, <laughs> I, I, missed, I missed my note. We're going to talk about cabbage and not the cabbages that you get on your plant-based diet. What cabbage are we talking about, James? I have no clue. I am at a loss. A uh, cabbage is the shorthand for coronary artery bypass graft or a cabbage or what I like to call getting a zipper on your chest. Oh. If you've seen people that have had bypasses, they've got right up the midline of their chest, yep. like they got a zipper on their chest. <laughs> what do you do when you get a cabbage? Uh, what you do is you take a blood vessel either in the chest, it's called the mammary artery or the leg. You could take an artery or vein out of the leg. You take one of those blood vessels and you got a blockage in a blood vessel, right? So you got to go around it. So you put that, that, that uh, blood vessel that you took out of your body, you put one at the beginning of the blockage and one at the end of the blockage and you bypass the blockage. That's all that a cabbage is. You put in a piece of your own blood vessel to bypass the blockage. <clears throat> Who really needs to get a cabbage? There are lots of people that get this procedure, which is <laughs> you basically got to be on a you know you're, you're basically get on a heart lung machine. You know you're kind of it's a pretty serious operation. I mean we're good at it, and the people that do it are great at it, and the mortality yeah. rates are very low. It's not like when it was first introduced back in my. 50 years ago when I got into the business. I mean, you know, we're good at it, but it doesn't mean you should be getting it if you don't need it. Here's when you may need it, is if you're, so there's a bunch of different blood vessels. There's a left main, the big artery that supplies the blood to the major part of your heart, the left side of your heart. The left main, if you got a blockage there, they call that the widow maker. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's one that uh, there may be an indication to get a bypass in. Or if you've got all three of your major blood vessels, three of them blocked, that may be an indication, especially if you're diabetic and especially if you have heart failure. But I'll tell you, James, there's a recent study that blows all this out of the water. Like I said, there's lots of studies that show that stents are not indicated unless you fail conservative medical treatment and you're still symptomatic. Bypass is a whole different game. And they did this study with over 5,000 people in 37 countries around the world and started 2012. The punchline, they looked at people that got invasive things like stents or bypass. No difference in survival from the people that had the conservative medical management. They put everybody on the medical management <clears throat> and they randomly assigned people to getting the invasive procedure. Half got the invasive procedure and half just got the medical management. Now this study is ongoing, but so far the results show no benefit in terms of long-term survival. If you get one of those either stents or bypass surgery. So the way so I look at it is you, there's benefits in doing the right things. You don't have to go all the way to the surgery. Instead of the surgery and stuff may not be better, you're good enough, or you may be helping yourself if you do the, the conservative things. Everybody should be on medical management. And the problem, James, and this really bugged me because I can't tell you how many times I see people that it would have these bypass surgeries, have the zipper on the chest, go through all that whole thing. 
and nobody goes into their lifestyle. Nobody looks at their cholesterol. Nobody sees their blood pressure. I mean, you shouldn't get paid if you're not doing the things that we know make a difference on, especially now we know even without the invasive stuff, you may do just as well. So anyway, uh, we are a, uh, procedure oriented uh, medical care system. And most of the time, less is more. That's one of my uh, articles that I produced a long time ago, less is more. And I was talking about dialysis. Um, so yeah, so basically, uh, stands for sure. We know no need, no benefit, unless you can't get your symptoms away with uh, medical management, the bypass, that seems to be the same thing, but I, I would wait until we get more data on people in the study to see how they do long term. So in general, that the non-invasive approach is as good as invasive. What is the non-invasive approach? We're going to go down these things one by one. Blood pressure control. We've talked about this over and over again. Really critical. You want to get your blood pressure to goal. And for most of you, it's below 120. Diabetics may be below 130. I would say if you're young and even if you're diabetic, below 120, get that as your goal blood pressure. If you are one of the people that's got the symptoms of decreased blood to your heart, this is called angina, right? Mm -hmm. The chest pain that people get with exercise is called angina. That's due to decreased blood flow. You're not getting enough blood to that heart muscle because you've got some narrowing of the arteries. You're not getting enough blood. That's called, that's what angina is about. <clears throat> so the beta blockers are one of the blood pressure drugs that can slow the heart down. So there's less demand on the heart muscle and lower your blood pressure. Good drug for people with coronary artery disease and chest pain. And how do you know you're on a beta blocker? Things like metoprolol, they, they end in OL, uh, labetalol, carvedilol, those are beta blockers. All I'm right. taking that first one, 300 milligrams a day. Good drug, and it can potentially benefit anyone who has had a heart attack should be on a beta blocker to prevent another heart attack. And we'll talk about this next session you should also be on aspirin and we're going to get into aspirin length because a lot of people are on aspirin and if you're over 60 and you haven't had a heart attack or a stroke or you haven't had a brain attack or a heart attack we'll talk about this next time probably think twice about going on the aspirin because aspirin can cause bleeding and the worst case would be bleeding in the brain and that's why they changed the recommendation to not pushing it unless you've already had one of these events or you're a younger patient like James is relatively young being on aspirin and having CKD4. I'm, I'm okay with that, James. All right. The other drug that we use for people with coronary artery disease and having chest pain and so forth are the calcium channel blockers. What are those? Amlodipine is a real widely used drug, good blood pressure drug, especially good if, if you've got symptomatic coronary artery disease. It helps open the blood vessels and controls your blood pressure. And it may help with some of those spasms of your coronary arteries. Um, the other drugs that we talk about a lot are which ones? Aces and arms. Yay, James. I love it. <laughs> so, so far, the three you've mentioned, I'm taking plus that spirolactone or whatever it is. I am not on an ACE or an ARB. Uh, but you don't have protein in the urine. Correct. Right? Mine's all gone. Anyone with protein in the urine, for sure, an ACE or an ARB. Should you be on an ACE or an ARB, James? Not a bad idea. And let me tell you for sure, if you've got protein in the urine of any significance or you've got a heart problem, these drugs are great. These drugs will help you live longer with heart problems, 
with coronary artery disease and help slow the decline of kidney function, especially if you've got protein in the urine uh, and you've got uh, CKD. <clears throat> and importantly, and we've talked about this several times, too many doctors stop these drugs because the creatinine goes up a little bit and your GFR goes down. Not unusual, very common. And the experts have agreed even if you get a 30% drop in your GFR, if you're one of these people that got the heart need, heart needs for the, taking an ACE, you've got the heart problems, you've got coronary artery disease, you've got heart failure, or you've got protein in the urine and you've got CKD, continue, worth continuing. The other problem with the ACEs and ARBs, sometimes what goes up, James? What, what le electrolyte on your labs? I do not. I want to guess potassium, but yes, yes, okay. absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> I still don't remember that one though. Absolutely, potassium can go up. Now James doesn't have to worry because James has low yeah. potassium. And that's why he's on spironolactone, which can raise the potassium. Um, but there's ways to get the potassium down and continue the ACE or R. The other drug that we talked about many times, and I think it's critical because <clears throat> it can lower the bad cholesterol and stabilize your arteries. You wanna keep the arteries from getting those clots on them and blocking off are the statins. Statins, simvastatins, pravastatin, all the statins, atorvastatin, the lipid drugs. Again, try to get your LDL below 100. And for most of you, I would say shooting for 60 is not a bad idea at all. Now, how effective are those drugs? So for example, that's something I, I need to talk to my doctor about getting on a statin because my LDL is so high and it's been high now for two years. Are they pretty effective or is this something where they've got to tweak them and I go they back? Are off very and... effective. They are very effective. I <clears throat> Too many docs use, they don't use adequate dosing. If you use the adequate dosing and, and you know, like if some, I don't know if anybody is on, Lipitor, a atorvastatin. I mean, it can come from, go from 10 milligrams all the way to 80 milligrams. If you get enough of the drug, and you and if one drug doesn't suit you, you could there's a whole list of other drugs. You should be able to get your bad cholesterol down. There are rare cases where you don't do it, and there's some newer drugs on the horizon for those people, but that's rare. Most of you shouldn't be a problem. And the last, well, it, okay. Aspirin, as we said, first thing to do if you if you call 911 with chest pain, pop an aspirin in. It may save your life. But uh, aspirin uh, can limit the inflammation, stabilize the blood vessel, and uh, lessen the likelihood of getting that clot. <clears throat> but we're going to spend a lot of time next time on the aspirin story. And the last thing is nitroglycerin. I just saw a picture of my grandma on my screen before I started the show. My grandma, bless her heart, had bad, bad coronary artery disease, popping those nitroglycerins in all the time. And I actually watched, as a kid, I watched my grandma die of a heart attack. Yeah, mm. right in front of my eyes. Nitroglycerin <clears throat> can <clears throat> uh, help those coronary arteries relax, increase the blood flow, <clears throat> and can definitely uh, help you with the uh, chest pain, the engine. There's all kinds of nitroglycerin type stuff, nitrodur, nitrostat, lots of different stuff. So as I always do, James, and I'm starting to lose my voice, <clears throat> we will have questions now. <clears throat> yeah, and we've got quite a few questions, but let me remind everyone, if you have a question for Dr. Rowe, we are live. If you're watching, it is Wednesday the 4th, hey, May the 4th, Star Wars Day. At a quarter till eight Eastern, we are live. If you're watching right now, type your questions in the comments. Now, if you're watching the recording, go ahead and type your questions in the comments. And I go back and I try to catch all the questions and share those with Dr. Rowe. And he likes to go back and look at them too to see, hey, what are people asking about so he can plan future shows. Now, there was a question a little bit earlier, and I am very curious this one too. Christina asked, could amlodipine cause shortness of breath? Is that one of its side effects? 
Okay, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> amlodipine is a great blood pressure drug. Amlodipine uh, can cause some fluid retention. Amlodipine is not a drug that has great benefits for a weak heart. So if you have a weak heart, which, which is called heart congestive heart failure or heart failure, I got some dirt on my screen here, um, then theoretically amlodipine could do that. I think for most folks who don't have heart trouble, uh, taking amlodipine should not give you shortness of breath, but it can give you a little bit of swelling. Uh -huh, very good. Now, Naomi asks, does panic attacks cause heart population danger? Yeah. You know, that's a great question. And panic attacks, <clears throat> I have a lot of personal experience in my family with that. And there's no question, James, I don't know if you've ever had it, but I've witnessed uh, family members and patients that have had it. You feel like you're dying. You absolutely feel like you're dying. And what happens in a panic attack is that your flight or fight or flight stuff, these, these hormones <clears throat> that get released, epinephrine, norepinephrine, uh, when we're under great stress, they can raise your heart rate, they can raise your blood pressure. <clears throat> and, and it feels like you're having a heart attack, but I guess if you already have coronary artery disease and your heart's getting trouble with enough blood flow, if you pump, you, you don't do it on purpose, of course. If you happen to have a heart, a, a panic attack, it could throw you into getting a heart attack, theoretically. Mm -hmm. Most people that have panic attacks are not the older folks that are at much higher risk of getting heart attacks and strokes. Um, they, they happen in younger people, by and large. They're not, they're not as common in older folks. I think so, I may have had a heart attack or a, uh, a panic attack once when I was in the hospital after my kidney diagnosis. There was a, a moment when I was in the bed in the ICU and I just could not breathe. No matter how much I tried, I couldn't catch my breath. My heart was racing. Um, oh, it's scary. It's terrible. Yeah. And alarms went off and they came in and yeah. uh, we got it all under control, but I, I've, if I remember right, I believe they told me it was just a panic attack. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll just, <laughs> what, what we used to do, uh, my first month as, a, uh, as an intern. Uh, 50 years in ago. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> in the emergency room, people would come in. They, you're hyperventilating, basically. And when you're breathing really fast, breathing really fast. And that can get you to have tingling in your fingers, too. I don't know if anybody experienced that. What we would do is have them breathe through a paper bag to slow their breathing down. And, and uh, yeah, anyway, okay. Very okay. good. Now we have another question here. Is there any relation, I'm gonna reword her question, between phosphorus and hardening of the arteries? There certainly might be. And it's a great question. And we will have a session about calcium phosphorus and bone disease of, kid, of CKD. The bottom line is we've been trying to get the phosphorus down for decades, and we've been working on this for people with, uh, especially dialysis patients that have real high phosphorus. And we've had them take these phosphate binders, uh, and uh, frankly, there's no good proof that we are extending people's lives. I mean, theoretically, the phosphorus that you, uh, well, here, here's what we think is the case. The phosphorus that are in all of these uh, fast foods, the preserved foods, the prepared mm -hmm. foods, the non-natural foods, the foods that are, that are modified, uh, they have a lot of phosphorus in it, phosphorus added. And that we think correlates with phosphorus, 
which causes deposits of calcium and phosphorus in your arteries and can worsen the hardening of the artery story. So that's, it's a story that we still don't have all the answers for, but that's a great question. I would just avoid, you know, eating the processed foods that we've talked about many times. Try to eat more uh, natural foods, fruits and vegetables, and not try to stay away from the processed foods as much as you can, the junk foods. That's where you get the bad phosphorus. Yeah, one one quick shortcut that my dietitian gave me was look at the label. You look for PHOS, FOS, because there's so many different forms of it. If it appears in the first half of the ingredients, skip it. If it appears more than once in the second half, skip it. That way I'm not getting too much of it. Now, Beth has a question. How do the statins work to lower LDL? Is that something you can discuss? No. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you, it has to do with a lot of organic chemistry and a lot of lipid chemistry and a lot of structural stuff, but you don't need to know it. Just know that it they works. work. And, and you don't need to uh, go off the statin. I mean, you can go off the statin. But here's something that's really common. A lot of people say, oh, I've had these aches and pains when I'm on the statin. My muscles hurt. And yeah, there are rare cases of people that can't tolerate statins. They get muscle problems. And there is real problems with advanced kidney disease in people that are taking medicines to lower their cholesterol, especially the, the something called fibric acid derivatives and the statins together. They can cause muscle breakdown. Extremely rare. The the proof of this muscle aches and pains from statins is, is, is not there. But here's my thing. If you're on a statin, your muscles ache, go on another statin. There's tons of them. That's the, that's a simple solution. Yeah. Very good. Okay, Deborah has a great question. Does the size of your veins combined with low blood pressure increase the risk of hardening of your arteries? I, there is... If anything, the lower the blood pressure, <clears throat> the lower that particular contributor to the hardening of the arteries risk. So I think low blood pressure in general, and we've talked about this before, if you've got a weak heart, low blood pressure could be a problem. But if you don't have a weak heart and your low blood pressure is just your normal blood pressure, you're lucky. You are not going to have nearly the risk of having any of these bad hearts things as someone with high blood pressure. And there's no, I don't know what you're talking about with the veins that that really doesn't relate. <clears throat> so the arteries, the arteries are the things that come from the heart. The veins go back to the heart, right? The arteries pump the, take the blood away from the heart and, and, uh, and the veins put the blood back in the heart. All right, Don's one of our regulars. Great to have you here again, Don. Love seeing regulars. Um, she asks, all right, do you have any thoughts on a nephrologist prescribing a low dose of a calcium channel blocker instead of an ACE or an ARB? No, uh, no proven <clears throat> kidney <clears throat> benefit. <clears throat> the calcium channel blockers have specific indications. For example, there's things like diltiazem, which is a calcium channel blocker, which can slow the heart down, like like metoprolol. Uh, and uh, yeah, but but in terms of specific kidney benefit, not to my knowledge. All right, Philip asks: Is there any correlation that you know of between blood pressure medications and arthritis? Um, not at all that I know of. <clears throat> And um, yeah, I mean, the only, <laughs> the only distant relation is if your blood pressure gets too low, you may fall and break a bone. <laughs> that, that's the only, that's a stretch. But, um, and, and it's not a joke because, you know, the, the common way older folks die is accidents. And one of the most important lessons for anyone watching the show, and if you are older 
and I'm getting older now, I'm 75, and you're 85 or 90 or 100, your chances of falling and ending your life become higher and higher. And as you get older, your bones get thinner, and it doesn't take much to get a break in, in your bone. And you break your bone, you wind up in the hospital, and a lot of folks don't ever leave it. And that's one of the potential issues about getting aggressive with gold target blood pressures of let's say 120 to 140 in an older patient. <clears throat> I would say, you know, like we talked about James, we used to just allow older folks to have 160 to 200, but we should certainly aim for lower blood pressure with the idea that you don't want to get it low enough if someone's blood pressure drops and they fall down and break a bone. All right. I have a great question here from Richard. This is something we've talked about from time to time, and it's a common concern amongst most kidney patients, especially when they're newly diagnosed. Richard asked, is it inevitable that I will go from stage three to stage four? I'm 64, eating a plant-based diet. Yay, very good there. Um, slight or no protein in the urine. Um, they're also on some medications. For someone who's 64, stage three, can you kind of talk about that? I, I'm pretty sure I can imagine some of the concerns Richard has. Yeah. So uh, stage three is a wide stage. Uh, and as we've talked about many times, stage three, 30 to 60. Now they're talking about 3A, which is 45 to 60. 3B is 30 to 45. 30 to 45 is more of a concern, obviously, than 45 to 60. And as you're getting closer to 65, 70, and if you're up closer to 60 in your GFR, it's, it could be close to normal for your age. More importantly, there was a study done um, in one of the Scandinavian countries, 10-year study, and they found a large segment of the CKD3, like the person who asked the question, had stable kidney function for 10 years. So no, no, uh, uh, not necessarily by any stretch that you will have a significant decline of kidney function, especially as you pointed out, you don't have protein in the urine, which is the best predictor of having a further decline of kidney function. So I would say you got a good chance of never getting to stage four. And even if they did make it a stage four, they could go decades in stage four exactly. before having any exactly. serious symptoms. Exactly, exactly. Or, or certainly or ever needing dialysis, which could, be, as we talk about in my book and, and other uh, discussions here, is, is should not really be considered until you're below 10 and maybe below five. So yeah, for most of you, not to worry. Yep, and that's a big part of your book. You talk about how you know the amount of protein that you're leaking, the role it plays as an indicator, age. When we go on the internet, especially when we're first diagnosed, we're going to a lot of the dialysis sites. They pretty much make it feel like stage four are these symptoms. It's going to be this. And then you're yeah. instantly going to get to stage five and you're on dialysis. And that's not what it's really like. And your book really helps explain that and relieve a lot of those concerns and that burden that we carry thinking that's what my future is. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So doc, we are at the top of the hour. I want to thank everybody for being here. Oh, and, and one other thing. Christina said, you look 60. <laughs> <laughs> you talking about me or you? <laughs> you? No, no, she's talking about you. Otherwise, it's not a compliment. <laughs> I got another decade before I hit 60. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, but it is great having you here, Doc. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. So important. I want to encourage everyone, please share the video. Um, on social media to help other people know the importance, especially for kidney patients. This impacts so many different people, but for kidney patients, uh, this is a true risk factor for us. And most of you 
are most likely not having this conversation with your doctors, with your healthcare team, and it's something important that we need to have the conversation. As a matter of fact, my doctor's on vacation, and as soon as he comes back, someone says, good one, doc. <laughs> as soon as my doctor gets back, I'm going to talk to him. I got to get my LDL down. It is, it's too high. I'm clearly at risk, and I want to get that taken care of. So I appreciate you, Doc. I appreciate everyone there. And let me uh, mention your book one more time. If you do not have this book, Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease by Dr. Rosansky, this is a fantastic book to get. You can go to go.dadvicetv.com slash book, which will take you directly to the book on Amazon or call up your local mom and pop store. Let's support the local stores. I, I buy from Amazon all the time. They get enough of our money. You know, go to your local bookstore. They'll appreciate the visit. Who knows what else you might find there. Um, and get yourself a copy of that book. It's fantastic. Super easy to read. It's not a whole bunch of medical jargon and things like that. You don't need a thesaurus as you're going through this book. You're going to understand it. You're going to feel great as you read about it and start taking control of your kidney disease and being your own number one advocate for great health care. All right, Doc, thank you so much, and thank you, everyone. This is our last, the only video of the week. Um, I will be back next week. I cannot remember who is on the schedule, but I will be back. Oh, Dr. Gibney is back, is here next week. Um, that is on the schedule. So, everyone, thank you so much, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye, everyone. <laughs>